Hi, and welcome to another episode of Cast from BI. Uh, today, we're doing something new. Today, we're doing a quick recording with just me talking about a topic. In this case, we're going to talk about Power BI Gen 2. So Gen 2 is out. We just saw the blog post. Power BI Gen 2 is out. It's GA. First question is probably is, you hear a lot of us talking about GA. What does GA mean? GA means general availability. And that means it's fully supported. Uh, you can open support tickets. It is production quality. It's no longer in preview. So everyone can be feel free and be happy and be, uh, you can just use it in production. That's what it really means. So, so it's, it's GA. What does it mean? What is the difference between Gen 1 and Gen 2? And why is it such a big deal? The most important thing is to think about it. Uh, Power BI Premium Gen 1 is, you can think about it, when you buy capacity there, you buy a server. That's it. You buy a P1, you get a server running inside of the Power BI environment that is about the same as the capacity that you're buying. So the amount of cores and the amount of memory, and the server is dedicated purely to you. In Power BI Gen 2, though, you're no longer buying a server. It is much more SaaS-like, which means you are buying a part on a big server hardware that is running out there. So immediately, that means there are a lot of big benefits. Like if you are a customer who's using a lot of P1s or P2s today, you probably get a performance benefit by just running on different hardware because we're all running, everyone is running on the same hardware. So we have pretty big, beefy machines that are running for everyone. So you get a performance hardware. Um, now you kind of buy this virtual server. You buy four cores with a, with a, with a P1. I, I actually don't know the real numbers from the top of my head. Um, and that gives you the performance benefit. The second thing is one of the massive changes that are there is that because we're now part of the pool, the memory limits that we used to have are no longer there. So in Gen 1, when you would buy a P1, you would get like 25 gigs of memory max. That means the cumulative memory usage of all your models in the P1 capacity would cannot reach 25 gigs. Then you would start running out of memory and things start to look, be loading back to disk and evictions and all of these things. That is no longer the case. Now, every data set in that capacity can use the amount of memory assigned by the SKU you're buying. So when you get a P1, and again, I'm, I might be slightly wrong on the actual numbers, but when you buy a P1, you can get 25 gigs per model, per data set. And that is huge. Of course, the thing to recognize and to remember, the one thing that hasn't changed is that memory limit is for everything that you're doing. So it is for the data sets that is being in memory. So everything, as you probably know, everything that we do in Power BI is loaded in memory into the Vertipack engine. That takes up a certain amount of data. But when we send queries, when we do refreshes, that memory grows. So if you, do, if you have a 12 gig model and you do a full refresh on the whole model, it probably takes another 12 gig temporarily to uh, use. So that is something to keep in mind. So if you have a 12 gig model sitting in memory, so you're checking on the task manager in Power BI Desktop, and you can see how much memory something is taking, and you refresh, you do a full refresh, uh, you also need that amount of memory, memory extra. So that kind of adds to it. Obviously, there are ways to reduce the memory size when you're refreshing. For example, you can use you can use an incremental refresh. Uh, you can use um, XMLA, so you can actually create partitions and refresh the partitions individually. And then you don't have to do keep in memory keep in mind that you need to use everything in memory. At that moment. You can just say, okay, I just want to refresh this table or I just want to refresh the partition for the current year and I don't have to refresh everything else. Then the memory limit will reduce significantly of what is needed for processing and you can load more memory into the base uh, model, if you will. So that's 
that's an important. The memory set, memory limit per data set is a, is a huge one. Now, the second one, which was also a, a interesting problem that you had to take a look at and you spend a lot of quite, quite a lot of time on is the refreshes in Power BI Gen 1. Because again, everything is running on your own server on the one capacity that you had. So if you were to, to do refreshes, if you do a lot of queries because people are looking at the reports and the data sets, um, those also take up resources of that capacity. So when you were doing eight refreshes on several di di different data sets and you were also looking at a few reports, pretty quickly you're running out of steam. Now, the good thing is with Premium Gen 2, again, data sets, refreshes, are not eating away from the same capacity or machine that you're using on your uh, queries. So it's like offloaded. So it's running on a separate machine. It's running processing there. Processing is not disturbed either by other processes. So the things that you can do there is much better. You have much more flexibility. You have much more uh, bandwidth uh, to play around with it. So again, that is a huge deal because a lot of time when we talk to customers, we know that refreshes are causing the problem on, the, on their premium capacity. It is eating up their uh, refresh time, it's reading, eating up their CPU, and now they're running out of steam and they're getting error messages and refreshes are failing. That is no longer the case. So that's really good. It's no longer competing with refreshes. The processing you're doing is no longer competing with refreshes. So, so that's important. Um, the other thing is important, and that is probably the biggest fundamental change, and a lot of people are maybe not need to get used to it a little bit more, is because you're not, no longer getting this, um, how should I say it? You're no, no longer getting this server directly, you are getting a virtual server. That means that everything we're doing is also calculated back to a virtual memory, if you will. If you look at the new premium capacity metrics app, you will pretty clearly see uh, the server memory, you will see uh, uh, the server memory, but also you see this new number that is showing up. And that is like virtual cores and virtual usage too. Uh, so that's that's pretty pretty important to, to recognize. So the way that it works is that the premium capacity evaluates throughput every 30 seconds. So it, it, the operation is complete, whatever you're doing, and collects the execution time on the shared pool, on those physical nodes that we do have, obviously, under the covers. And then it aggregates them into 30 second CPU intervals. Okay, so again, it is doing this under the covers. We have something like vCore execution time that we're looking at under the covers. Um, and the way that we aggregate that information is pretty complex. Uh, we, there's two different ways. We have slow running, running operations, data set and data flow refreshes are considered background operations. And they typically run in the background. So we use, we don't have to actually monitor them and look at them visually. Uh, and they take, they're lengthy and they take a significant amount of CPU power. So we spread the CPU cost of those background operations over 24 hours. So capacities don't hit max resource usage on the simultaneous time. And that is also a huge difference. We spread out that uh, CPU cost over 24 hours. That is a, a big deal because again, if you are like doing a lot of loads at eight o'clock in the morning, people want to get the data ready, you might go run out of CPU time at that particular moment in time, but for the capacity that you bought, you bought X amount of vCores, you're doing a lot of refreshes at eight o'clock in the morning, with P1, you would run out of capacity over, you would run into problems pretty quickly. Now, because that CPU time is spread out over 24 hours, you won't get to the same level of trouble. So that's a, that's a massive change too. Um, so this allows Premium Gen 2 uh, users to run as many background operations as allowed by their capacity and really not limited to the same as what you had in Premium Gen 2. Now, for fast operations, things like queries, report loads, interactive operations, uh, the CPU time is aggregated to minimize uh, the number of 30-second windows that are impacted. 
So fast operations are still spiky. So if you have a lot of usage and a lot of things happening at this moment, certain, certain moment of time, you could, could, could run into trouble. But again, this is, and we'll talk more about the second, this is where auto scale will start being interesting. Um, so now let's quickly talk about uh, size limits and enforcing. So the important thing to recognize and to remember here is, um, of course, this also means that at one point we will be starting to enforce, enforce limits on the capacity that you have. So when you do interactive utilization, it means we're going to take a look into, okay, how much uh, CPU time are you, is needed that we use for this query. And if you have too much CPU time in aggregate, uh, over the current 30 seconds that is that we're looking at, then the next ones will start uh, not failing. It will start and go into an interactive request query delay mode. So that means that subsequent requests will bec become slower and slower and slower. Uh, of course, the admins will get warnings that uh, we have entered in such a state and they will know that there's something going on. Now, that leads us to the second part, something else that is new in Power BI Premium Gen 2. If you never want to be in this state, of course, so let, let's put it this way. In premium gen one, you will get out of memory errors, okay? Which is not good. In premium gen two, you won't get errors. You will, we will just gradually get slower and, and, and uh, the admins will get warnings. But if you do not want to be in this state, there's also an option because again, this is the benefit of having a big pool. We will also have the option to turn on auto scaling. And auto scaling, what will happen is when you turn on auto scaling. Um, so when you do auto scaling, what happens is when you reach that same limit, instead of becoming slower, we would actually add one V core for the next 24 hours to your pool. And things will just keep on running. Uh, obviously, how does that work? And what are the things that actually means to happen? So if you turn on auto scaling, we would use your Azure subscription to reserve uh, this one vCore, and you obviously pay for it. Um, so auto scaling is really for peaks when you're not expecting them because they are more costly than regular cores if you just buy them in your capacity. Um, so it's really to make sure that, okay, even if you buy a, a, a P3 or a P1 or a P2, and all of a sudden someone shares a report with everyone in your organization, uh, you don't want to get surprised and you're, you don't want your CIO to get error messages or really slow reports. Autoscale will help you here. Obviously, there are limits to it. Uh, again, you can set it in autoscale mode. You can set things like a, the regular things in Azure. You can say how much max you want to spend and how long and, and how much. Uh, so you can limit it. You can limit the autoscale of what's going on. So autoscale is pretty important, pretty interesting. But again, I see it as, as, a, as a last resort and an escape hatch. I wouldn't recommend doing it as like 80-20 rule or something, like 80% of your uh, usage, it's regular CPU and it's regular capacity and 20% you think it's auto scale because the cost of the auto scale is higher than the regular ones. You can probably buy a second capacity uh, for the same cost. Okay, so that's auto scale. Auto scale is also very important. That kind of brings us to the next point. Another interesting thing is um, previously it was interesting if you wanted to do uh, if you wanted to get separate capacities for each like component and things like this, and you had to load balance between them because everything is like a virtual server now anyway. Why not think about consolidating your capacities too? Like let's say you have two P1s, why don't you just move, move them together into one P2? Because you don't have to move things around anymore. There's a lot of things that no longer are really needed. Um, so the other thing that I re would recommend is, okay, take a look at your estate, take a look at all the capacity that you have and see if you can merge everything together into one big capacity. Because it doesn't really matter anyway and you get benefits from it, right? If you have two P1s and you move it into a P2, now all your data sets can be as big as a P2, which is big, much bigger than what you can do with P1. Um, so there are benefits to it. And I don't see really any downsides of 
merging all your capacities into a bigger one. So that's another interesting thing to think about. Now, um, finally, the last thing that I want to talk about is because we now have this SaaS platform for premium, the most important thing that we'll have is uh, the capability of also using premium per user. And premium per user is the same thing as premium, only now it's for you per user. So that's important too. Obviously, when you have premium per user, you buy for a single user, you get part of that shared capacity. Uh, whenever you're sharing with other people, they also need to get a premium per user license. Otherwise, they won't be able to receive the, receive the reports. So the way that it works in premium per user is um, you get a similar behavior as all the other users that are using premium capacity. So um, if you own a single PPU license, the system will throttle you when your uh, uh, usage pattern is much higher than dozens of typical users that are also using PPU. So it's really important uh, to recognize that. So premium per user is gonna give you a lot of interesting, if you have a smaller organization or you just want to play around with premium and you don't want to spin up a whole thing, like maybe you're doing some development work and all of these things, um, premium per user is also giving you a slice of that premium capacity. There's no management for it, no nothing. That's the that's the ease of use for premium capacity because you're just getting a slice of the cake. Uh, if you eat more cake, then you start to get trolled, similar to what we see when you have a premium capacity. Um, the only thing is, it is being compared to all the other users that are using premium capacity. So it's pretty generous if you think about it. Now, finally, the thing that I want to talk about too is the, mo the monitoring. So to monitor your premium Gen 2, you get the Gen 2 metrics app. Uh, here, there's a few interesting pages. We have an overview page, an evidence page, a refresh uh, page. Uh, those are the most important ones. Uh, on the overview page, the first thing you will be able to see is a weekly trend line. So it kind of gives you the capacities behavior over the past four weeks, and it sees, okay, how much CPU did you use? How many reports, dashboards, data sets, artifacts were there that were using CPU, active users, and how many cores you used during those weeks. Um, now, to look into artifacts, it's easy to figure out which one is using the most expensive artifacts. So you have a, a matrix visual that shows you what is the item that is easy because it could be data flows, it could be data sets, and you will see how much CPU did it use, what's the duration, um, how much memory did it use, was it being throttled or not? So maybe this one, this data set took care of a lot of the overloading of the capacity. So that's important. Um, and then on the bottom, you'll see uh, the evidence. So there's a new page that shows you the evidence of what's going on. So you can go in and find, okay, what are the artifacts that are using this overloading? What are the artifact utilization details? Um, how many number of users experience overload penalties? And then you can go figure out what's going on. So, uh, and finally, the, the most important item too is, the, is, is, is refreshes. So you... In the capacity metrics app, you can easily go and see, okay, what's the current state of my capacity? Which data sets are causing overloads? How many users were affected by these overloads? And then finally, there's a refresh tab that also gives you, okay, so because even though refreshes are not com competing anymore with data sets with CPU, they still use CPU. So you can go in and say, okay, the refresh page is gonna give you uh, the, the CPU comp consumption power, any aspects concerning refresh performance. So there is a, a pivot table that allows you to say, okay, I wanna refresh, how many refreshes by artifact? How much CPU, how long did it take? And then allows you to quickly go ahead and figure out uh, what's going on. So that's metrics app. Now, finally, talking about migration. So. The current dates, and again, this might change, but I don't think it will. It is already GA, so that's good. That won't change. Uh, at one point in November 15th, we'll start sending notifications to remind customers to migrate from Gen 1 to Gen 2. And finally, in January 
of 2022, Microsoft will start migrating customers over from Gen 1 to Gen 2 automatically. The migration story today is really, really, really simple. You go to your premium capacity and you click a toggle and then it toggles from Gen 1 to Gen 2 and that's it. So there's no tools needed, no migration or anything. It's relatively simple and straightforward. And that's it. And that is Gen 2 in a nutshell. Um, again, pretty big change. We've seen a lot of customers, are the enterprise customers that me and my team work with, move to Gen 2, and they're really, really excited about what's going on and what it means for their organizations. The less management overhead they have to do. Uh, obviously, it is not completely done. There are many things that we want to add to the tool. For example, cross-charging. Like, okay, so this data set belongs to this person and I want they used so much CPU, so this is the build I want to give to, to him. As an IT organization, maybe you want to do this and there are some organizations who are doing this. Today, it's not necessarily possible yet inside of the, the, uh, the metrics app, but that is something the team is working on and is, uh, wants to deliver in the next couple of months. So that's important too. So keep an eye out on this. If you're using Gen 2, I think it will be very good for you. Um, and that's it. And that was a quick one, 20 minutes. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something. Uh, actually, I learned something because I went into the more of the depths of Gen 2. So that's, that's pretty cool. And uh, I hope to see you next time. Thank you.